big story out of Idaho. We finally might get some answers in that big murder case because the man accused of killing four students at the University of Idaho, now back in the state to face first-degree murder charges. The suspect was arrested last week at his parents' home in Pennsylvania. He left the state yesterday and flew back to Idaho after waiving his right to an extradition trial. National correspondent Addie Guajardo is live in Moscow, Idaho, with reaction from residents there. Good morning, Addie. Well, good morning, Jay. Residents gathered outside the Leta County Jail yesterday, waiting, hoping to get a glimpse of this suspect, Koberger, who's been accused of murdering those four students. Now, people told me that they've been tracking this story for several weeks. Some expressed shock. Others described this as a very weird interesting moment for this small town made up of about 25,000 people. Koberger arrived at the Pullman Moscow Regional Airport in Washington State, which is only about 10 minutes away from this county jail. And they drove down here. Several patrol cars came in quickly into the parking lot right behind us, pushed him into a garage, and that's where he was taken out. A lot of media outlets were kind of left waiting to see if they would get a glimpse of him. At least we weren't able to get a glimpse of him here, but there was a lot of video we were able to capture as he was getting off off that plane at the airport. Now, I spoke to a couple who tells us that they tracked his plane, went out to the airport, then out to this county jail. Uh, they tell me that for a long time they were they were scared of coming to this Moscow area, only to find out that Koberger was actually living just two minutes away from their home out in Pullman, which is about 10 minutes away from here. I spoke to one of those people, and they, they I asked them, I said, look, you've been looking at the story for several weeks now. You've been tracking it. You've been following it. You're obviously very interested in it. I asked him, what do you think? How do you feel about this suspect? And this is what he had to say. It seems like the cops, you know, they've been quiet. Um, they've probably been building up evidence for us, so they're pretty sure. Um, it all makes sense, the Elantra, everything. Um, yeah, it's 100%. It's definitely him, without doubt. You just look on, the, look on his faces. He tells it all. Look at yeah. his face. So, blank face, everything. So... Look, Jay, some people have already made up their mind, but the Pennsylvania attorney, Fo Koberger, says that he's looking forward to being exonerated. Now, Koberger will be held at this county jail until he makes an initial appearance at, by a count, in front of a county magistrate. At this hearing, he will be read his rights. He'll also be uh, form, formally given the charges that he's facing, which are four counts of first-degree murder and one count of burglary. At this time, he will not be asked to give a plea. Now, DNA evidence reportedly is linking Koberger to the crime scene. And then we're also hearing from sources that uh, the, the vehicle, a Hyundai Elantra, a white one that the police department was looking for, is also a vehicle they say that is potentially connected to him because he drives a very similar one. Now, I also spoke with, with the attorney of the family of victim Kaylee Gonsalves, and that attorney tells me that the family is eagerly awaiting for the probable cause affidavit to be released. Uh, this could provide uh, some more light on exactly what what kind of evidence they have against Koberger. Now, investigators are still looking for key pieces of evidence, including uh, the murder weapon that was used at the crime scene. They're also looking for a motive for this cause. And look, Jay, last night, as everybody was waiting to see that mugshot that was uploaded by the Leda County Jail, uh, there was actually an overwhelming amount of people wanting to get that mugshot that there was a wait time. I had to wait uh, a few minutes before I was even able to download the website and be able to get a hold of that photo. So obviously, this story garnering national attention. So much interest in this case. National correspondent Addy Guajardo reporting for us. Thanks, Addy. Well, so far, there have been few answers in these high-profile homicides that, of course, shook that small town, that college community. But all that could change soon once finally some of those court documents are unsealed and we get to know some of the key questions, motive, any connection to the victims, things like that. And there are legal reasons why they could yes. have been uh, released until now. So for the first time, we'll learn how police were able to identify the suspect after nearly seven weeks of searching. Joining us live this morning to discuss more on what's to come. In this case, Shakira Sanders a law professor at the University of Idaho's College of Law. And this school year, she's a visiting professor at Penn State Dickinson Law. Professor, thank you so much for your time this morning. So when police announced the arrest, they made it very clear about how information uh, will come out with this affidavit uh, in the days ahead. Uh, let's listen to what the prosecutor had to say. Those affidavits attached to those search warrants are still under seal, so I can't discuss their contents with you. Uh, but one was for the person 
of uh, Mr. Koberger, uh, collecting DNA and photographs, that sort of thing. One was for the uh, white Elantra vehicle, uh, which um, I understand uh, has been seized and uh, is being processed. And one was for the address, the residence itself that he was living in. So what type of information should we expect to learn and is motive going to be included in there? So what we should expect to learn pretty soon uh, is what is the basis for determining that there's probable cause to arrest this individual for these four murders and perhaps uh, a, a burglary crime as well. Uh, what we have now is a sealed affidavit that is part of a uh, warrant application. Uh, once our defendant uh, uh, is formally arrested, then he has to have his initial appearance and there is where we will find out what is the basis for probable cause here. For you looking at the case with obviously a legal mind, what are your key questions? What do you want to know and what do you think is most legally important to know? Well, right now, I think the most legally important question is whether or not there's probable cause, uh, which is a standard determined by the totality of the circumstances. It's not as high of a burden as a beyond a reasonable doubt. It is more uh, than a reasonable suspicion. Uh, so what uh, legally the most important question is, is whether that's probable cause. If there's probable cause, then this defendant can be arrested and brought to trial. If there's no probable cause, then there is the inability to arrest this defendant and then proceed to trial. Okay, on a human level, what's your real question about the case? You obviously have followed it. What do you, on a, in layman's terms, not the legalese, just a little bit of what do you think? What's the real thing here you really think uh, the, the, that, that you on a personal level you think the public will be interested in knowing? Because there's some key questions. We don't know the motive. We don't know if there was a connection. We don't know why it took cops seven weeks. So things of that nature. Well, I think if I were a resident of Moscow, Idaho, and I should say I worked there for three years when I first started at the University of Idaho, the most important question to me would probably be, does law enforcement have the right person? Uh, I am pretty sure many of the residents there uh, uh, have uh, lived in fear, I think for the victims' families as well. Uh, you want to know that law enforcement has it right. And really, the only legal standard at this time to tell us that is the probable cause standard. So while it may sound a little legalese, uh, to me, that is the most important question right now. That, of course, in the safety uh, of the individuals who live in Moscow, Idaho, uh, uh, and the well-being of the victims' families. So the defendant is expected to face uh, first-degree murder charges. What are the chances he could face the death penalty? Now, that is an interesting question. I haven't heard uh, in news reports either way from prosecutors whether they plan for this to be a capital or death penalty case. You would think because of the number of victims and the viciousness uh, that's been described by law enforcement when it comes to uh, the crimes, uh, uh, that this could be uh, a death penalty eligible case. And a lot of it has to do with what information law enforcement knows uh, about the defendant's motives here. And we really haven't heard anything about that from law enforcement. To a uh, two-part kind of in the weeds question a little bit, what is the likelihood in this case you think we'll see some kind of gag order? And then in a high-profile case, we always have the issue of uh, what defense will allege is the inability to find an impartial jury, uh, which would be an argument bolstered in the fact that this is a small town. This isn't a New York or a Chicago or Philly or, 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 or what have you. How do you expect those two factors to possibly play out? Well, those two issues are actually closely related. We've already seen a gag order in this case yesterday issued by the magistrate that prevents the parties, meaning the defendant and the government, from talking about the case to the public. 
I think a lot of that has to do with the concern that there is uh, the inability, perhaps, to find an unbiased jury locally in Moscow, Idaho, since this will be litigated in the courts there. And there's certainly some precedent for this in the state of Idaho, with the Lori Vallow case having to be moved to uh, Ada County instead of its original county due to uh, bias issues and concerns about the jury pool, I wouldn't be surprised here if there are similar concerns that the magistrate is trying to head on before uh, uh, they can become larger problems. All right, Professor Shakira Sanders, thank you so much for your time and your insight. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me.